Frankfurt, which is where he was at the university in, in Germany. And uh, he was on his way back from his father's house. They maybe had a little bit of an argument about uh, the direction his life was taking. And he was on his way back to, to Erfurt, and he passed by a little village called Stottenheim. And as he passed by this village, uh, there was a sort of, it was in July, uh, 1509, and um, a sort of summer thunderstorm um, hit the area where he was. And as he was walking along this, this road, and yes, he gives us an impression that he was in a little bit of a turmoil, wondering what direction his life was, was taking, wondering about his own salvation. And anyway, this summer, um, this thunderstorm hit. Um, a bolt of lightning hit the ground very near to where he was. He fell down to the ground, absolutely terrified, and in his moment of terror, cried out, St. Anne, help me, I'll become a monk. Uh, St. Anne was a kind of patron saint of the local area where he was, and this was a desperate cry, please help me, under the sort of terror of God's, God's judgment. And um, he decides to become a monk, and the reason he becomes a monk is quite simple. He says later on, I didn't become a monk because I wanted an easy life. Um, uh, I didn't become a monk for any other reason um, than to save my soul. Uh, for him, the, the, the road of monasticism was the, it was the, the fast lane to salvation. Um, now, it's important to understand something about this background. Um, maybe we can have the next two things up in the slide as well, so we can get that in the picture. There is, there's Luther as a monk. Um, that portrait is from 1520. Um, and uh, it depicts him as an Augustinian monk. Now, he becomes a monk in order to save his soul. Now, for us, that's a slightly odd, odd idea. Uh, most of us wouldn't think of entering a monastery to save uh, our souls. But um, the reason um, Luther did that was because in the late Middle Ages, there was a particular understanding of salvation. And the salvation was understood as something which happens as a result of an internal process of change within you. Um, there's a recognition that we, as uh, even as Christians, are people in whom grace is at work, but we are still sinful. So if you like bringing it crudely, there may be a, a part of us which is, which is holy uh, and, and touched by grace, and there's another part of us which is still sinful. And gradually the sinful bit needs to be eroded and taken over by the holy part. And only at the end, when we are fully 100% holy, when sin has been eradicated from our lives altogether, only then can we be said to be justified, fully saved. And so, any Christian is always on the road to salvation, on the road to justification. And there's a sort of part of you which is holy, but that's going to grow, and the sinful part's going to get less, and, uh, and so on. So, um, Salvation is based upon a process of inner transformation where you become fully holy. Okay? Now, there's obviously a slight flaw in that argument because the realization is that you know, even by the time you die, uh, most people have not got to that stage where you are 100% holy. Uh, and that, of course, is where the doctrine of purgatory comes in. Because the idea is that, that stage, when you die, as a Christian, as a baptized Christian, um, you then enter purgatory, which is the place where the remaining sin and all the punishment for that sin is, is purged. Well, that's why it's called cold purgatory. Uh, and that's purged from you. And at the end of purgatory, you can then enter into the blessedness, the presence of God Himself. But that's the understanding of salvation. Now, you can understand in that context, um, the option of entering a monastery was quite an attractive one for someone like Luther. Because that is a kind of accelerated process of inner transformation. Because you haven't got to worry about doing a job and earning money and, and um, you know, having a wife and kids and all those distracting things that might take you away from God. No, you can give your attention to God fully. And you can pray, you can go to Mass, you can say confession. Your whole attention is focused upon this process of inner transformation. It's the, it's the, the high road to heaven for Luther. And that's why he becomes the monk. So that monastic background is really quite important to him. Now the other factor which was quite important to, for, for Luther's monastic background was that um, it introduced him to a number of uh, very important spiritual practices, uh, notably the saying of the Psalms. Um, in monastic life in the Middle Ages, you would recite the Psalms, the entire Psalter, 150 Psalms, every week. Um, so you, you said it again and again and again. You got to know the Psalms pretty well as a 
medieval monk. So here's Luther. He enters into the Augustinian uh, monastery in the city of Erfurt. Erfurt is the, uh, the town where he was studying um, at the time. He enters into the monastery and he becomes a monk. Now, the second thing to grasp about Luther's background is, if you like, monasticism is his spiritual background. That's the spirituality that shapes him. But there's also a theological background. Um, Luther seemed at the beginning to be on, a, on the trajectory of, of entering a, a career as a lawyer, and maybe ending up as a kind of civil servant within the, uh, the government of uh, the Saxony, the region where he was in Germany. Um, and um, if we could just go back up this way. Um, he, um, as a result of this spiritual experience, this um, moment of terror where he enters the monastery, and his friends try to dissuade him, of course, he goes back to to, to, to Erfurt after this, and his friends say, no, oh, don't worry, it was only a panic moment, you don't have to do anything about it. Um, but he says, no, I've got to do it, I, I made my promise, and he enters the monastery. Uh, he also uh, then engages in the study of theology, and he's done the basic arts course in Erfurt, as you do at a medieval university, and he focuses upon theology. And he is taught within the faculty of theology in Erfurt, and he is taught by members of a particular school of theology at the time, which was known as the Via Moderna the modern way. And the modern way was opposed to the via antiqua, the old way, the via antiqua was the kind of theology associated with Thomas Aquinas, that you thought about last time. And the, the, via, the via moderna was associated with a number of other theologians, um, such as, for example, um, Gabriel Beale. And Gabriel Beale, a very important late medieval theologian, uh, who had written a, a very important work, uh, which Luther had studied in his, what well, Luther came to study in his preparation to be ordained. Because uh, as, a, as a monk, one of the things that um, some monks did was to get ordained, and Luther um, was uh, recommended that he should get ordained. Uh, and in order to train for the, the priesthood, uh, he didn't go away to seminary or anything like that, he simply were given a book to read. And the book was um, uh, a book by this man, Gabriel Beale, called um, His Commentary on the Sacred Canon of the Mass. It was a, a long book, which was a theological commentary on the liturgy of the Mass at the time. And Luther read this. And in this book, which is a classic um, expression of the theology of the Via Moderna, which is to say one particular strand of late medieval theology in which Luther was taught. And um, in this, this book, there's one key idea which comes through Beale's teaching. And the idea is this, that um, uh, salvation is a kind of, well, it works by a covenant. God has made a covenant, pactum is the Latin phrase for it, or bunt is the German um, word for it. God has made a covenant by which um, we each do our bit. We, as sinners, have to do what lies within us. The Latin phrase is quod in se es. We do what we can. Um, and that was normally interpreted as turning towards God, you know, having a Beginnings of a sense of love for God, turning away from our sins. We do that that we can. We, we do our best. We do what lies within us. God then gives us grace. He then gives us his grace in response to our initial action, 